Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our channel. Today we have a very important topic to discuss leprosy. This ancient disease has been surrounded by myths and misconceptions for centuries, so let's delve into the facts and shed some light on this often misunderstood condition. What is leprosy? Leprosy, also known as Hansen's disease, is a chronic infectious disease caused by the bacterium Mycobacterium leprae. It primarily affects the skin, peripheral nerves, and mucosal surfaces of the respiratory tract. Brief History of Leprosy Ancient Origins Leprosy is one of the oldest recorded diseases in human history. References to a condition resembling leprosy can be found in ancient texts, including the Bible and ancient Indian and Chinese writings. Spread and Migration Leprosy likely originated in East Africa or South Asia and spread to other parts of the world through human migration and trade routes. Scientific Discovery in the late 19th century, the Norwegian physician Gerhard Armauer Hansen identified the bacterium Mycobacterium leprae as the causative agent of leprosy. Treatment Advancements The introduction of antibiotics in the mid-20th century, particularly the use of dapsone, rifampicin, and clofazamine, revolutionized the treatment of leprosy. Global Efforts Organizations such as the World Health Organization WHO, have been actively involved in global efforts to eliminate leprosy. About Causal Agent of Leprosy Shape and Size Mycobacterium leprae is a rod-shaped bacterium, classified as an acid-fast bacillus. It is relatively small, with dimensions ranging from 2 to 6 micrometers in length and approximately 0.2 micrometers in width. Cell wall composition. The bacterium's cell wall is a crucial component that contributes to its unique characteristics. It contains a high lipid content, particularly mycolic acids, which makes the cell wall resistant to standard bacterial staining procedures. Acid-fast staining. One of the distinctive features of Mycobacterium leprae is its ability to retain stains, even after exposure to acid alcohol solutions. This characteristic is known as acid-fast staining. The acid-fast property is due to the high lipid content in the cell wall, making it impermeable to many dyes. No gram staining. Mycobacterium leprae is challenging to stain using the gram staining method, which is commonly used for bacterial classification. The high lipid content and unique cell wall structure make it resistant to the traditional gram stain. Slow growth. Mycobacterium leprae has an extremely slow growth rate, which poses challenges for laboratory culture and isolation. In fact, attempts to culture the bacterium outside the human body have been largely unsuccessful. Obligate intracellular parasite. Mycobacterium leprae is an obligate intracellular parasite, meaning it can only survive and replicate within host cells, particularly macrophages and Schwann cells, cells that form the myelin sheath around nerves. How leprosy transmits. Person-to-person -person transmission. The primary mode of transmission is person-to-person, -person, especially through prolonged close contact with an untreated and actively infected individual. Respiratory droplets containing the bacteria are released into the air when the infected person talks, coughs, or sneezes. Susceptibility. Not everyone is equally susceptible to leprosy. The majority of people have a natural immunity to the bacterium. It is estimated that around 95% of individuals are naturally resistant to M. leprae. Close and prolonged contact. Transmission is more likely to occur with close and prolonged contact with an untreated individual over an extended period. Household contacts, especially family members, of an untreated leprosy patient are at a higher risk of contracting the disease. It's important to note that leprosy is not highly contagious, and the majority of people who come into contact with M. leprae do not develop the disease. How Mycobacterium leprae causes disease, pathogenicity in human. Entry and invasion. M. leprae enters the human body through the respiratory tract. Inhalation of respiratory droplets containing the bacterium can lead to infection. The bacterium is taken up by macrophages, which are immune cells that play a key role in the body's defense against pathogens. Immune response. The immune response to M. leprae varies among individuals. Most people have a natural resistance to the bacterium, and they do not develop clinical symptoms. In individuals who do develop leprosy, the immune response may be insufficient to clear the infection completely, allowing the bacterium to persist and multiply. Peripheral nerve involvement. M. leprae has a particular affinity for nerve tissues. The bacterium can invade Schwann cells, which are cells that form the myelin sheath around nerves. The invasion of Schwann cells and peripheral nerves contributes to the neurological manifestations of leprosy. Clinical spectrum. Leprosy presents a spectrum of clinical manifestations, ranging from tuberculoid to lepromatous forms. In the tuberculoid form, the immune response is stronger, leading to localized skin lesions and nerve damage. This form is less infectious. In the lepromatous form, the immune response is weak, resulting in widespread bacterial dissemination, skin lesions, and extensive nerve involvement. This form is more infectious. Nerve damage and disability. 
The chronic nature of leprosy can lead to nerve damage and loss of sensation in affected areas. This can result in injuries, ulcers, and secondary infections, often leading to disability. Transmission. The transmission of leprosy occurs primarily through respiratory droplets from untreated and actively infected individuals. The bacterium is released into the air when infected individuals cough or sneeze. What are the symptoms of leprosy? The two main types of leprosy are tuberculoid and lepromatous, each with distinct clinical features. Common symptoms include skin lesions. In case of tuberculoid leprosy, few, well-defined, hypopigmented, light-colored skin lesions with raised edges. These lesions may be numb or have decreased sensation. In case of lepromatous leprosy, widespread skin lesions with a nodular appearance, often accompanied by skin discoloration. Nerve involvement. In case of tuberculoid leprosy, nerve damage is common, leading to sensory loss, muscle weakness, and, in severe cases, paralysis. In case of lepromatous leprosy, extensive nerve involvement can result in loss of sensation, muscle weakness, and deformities. Facial nerve involvement may cause a loss of blinking reflex and lag ophthalmos, inability to close the eyes. Eye damage. Both forms of leprosy can affect the eyes, leading to blindness if left untreated. This can result from corneal damage and secondary infections. Thickened peripheral nerves. Enlarged and thickened nerves, especially around joints, can be palpated in leprosy patients. Loss of sensation. A hallmark of leprosy is the loss of sensation in affected areas. Patients may not feel pain, heat, or cold, leading to a higher risk of injuries and secondary infections. Muscle weakness. Nerve damage can lead to muscle weakness, especially in advanced cases of leprosy. Systemic symptoms. Fever, fatigue, and weight loss may occur, particularly in the lepromatous form. It's important to note that leprosy progresses slowly, and symptoms may take years to develop. Early diagnosis and treatment with multidrug therapy, MDT, are crucial in preventing complications, disability, and interrupting the transmission of the disease. How to diagnose leprosy? Clinical examination. A skilled healthcare provider, often a dermatologist or a leprosy specialist, conducts a thorough clinical examination to assess skin lesions, nerve involvement, and other symptoms. Leprosy can present in various forms, including tuberculoid and lepromatous, and the clinical features help classify the disease according to the ridley jopeling classification. Skin smear examination. A slit skin smear test involves collecting a sample from skin lesions or peripheral nerves. The collected material is stained and examined under a microscope to detect acid-fast bacilli, specifically Mycobacterium leprae. This test helps classify leprosy into possibacillary, few bacteria, or multibacillary, many bacteria, forms. Biopsy. A skin biopsy may be performed to examine skin lesions and assess the cellular changes in the presence of acid-fast bacilli. Biopsy samples can aid in confirming the diagnosis and determining the type of leprosy. Nerve function tests. Nerve function tests, such as sensory testing and nerve conduction studies, help assess nerve damage and loss of sensation. These tests are particularly useful in confirming the diagnosis and determining the extent of neurological involvement. Polymerase chain reaction PCR, PCR tests can be employed to detect the DNA of Mycobacterium leprae in clinical samples. PCR is a molecular technique that can provide a sensitive and specific diagnosis, especially in cases where other methods may not be conclusive. Antibody detection tests. Tests that detect antibodies against specific leprosy antigens can be used for supportive evidence of leprosy. What is treatment for leprosy? The treatment for leprosy involves the use of multidrug therapy, MDT, which is a combination of antibiotics. MDT is highly effective in killing the bacteria responsible for leprosy, Mycobacterium leprae. The World Health Organization, WHO, recommends specific drug regimens based on the type and severity of leprosy. Treatment is typically provided free of charge in leprosy endemic countries. The key components of MDT include, Possibacillary leprosy, PB, for individuals with limited skin lesions and few bacteria, the recommended treatment is a combination of two drugs, Dapsone and Rifampicin. This regimen usually lasts for six months, and patients are closely monitored for response to treatment. Multibacillary leprosy, MB, for individuals with more widespread skin lesions and a higher bacterial load, the treatment regimen includes three drugs, Dapsone, Rifampicin, and Clofazamine. The duration of treatment for multibacillary leprosy is typically 12 months. How to prevent leprosy? Early detection and treatment. Early diagnosis and treatment of leprosy cases are crucial in preventing the spread of the disease and reducing complications. If someone develops symptoms suggestive of leprosy, such as skin lesions or nerve involvement, seeking prompt medical attention is essential. 
Leprosy Control Programs Many countries with a history of leprosy have established national control programs to detect and treat cases, raise awareness, and reduce the stigma associated with the disease. Collaboration with these programs can contribute to early case detection and effective treatment. Chemoprophylaxis Close contacts of individuals diagnosed with leprosy, particularly household members, may be given chemoprophylaxis preventive medication to reduce the risk of developing the disease. Immunization Currently, there is no specific vaccine available for preventing leprosy. However, research is ongoing in this area. Bacillus calmet garin BCG, vaccine, which provides some protection against tuberculosis, has shown some potential in reducing the incidence of leprosy. Maintaining good personal hygiene Practicing good personal hygiene, including regular handwashing, can help reduce the risk of various infections, including respiratory infections that may contribute to the transmission of leprosy. Community education and awareness. Public education campaigns that dispel myths and misconceptions about leprosy can contribute to reducing stigma and discrimination. Inclusive healthcare. Ensuring that healthcare services are inclusive and accessible to everyone, including those with leprosy, is important for early detection and treatment. Research and surveillance. Ongoing research and surveillance on leprosy transmission and improved diagnostic tools can contribute to better prevention and control strategies. Conclusion. That's it for today's video on leprosy. I hope this information has been enlightening and helps to break down some of the misconceptions surrounding this ancient disease. If you found this video informative, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more content on health and well-being. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.